There have been terrible times in human history where doing good deeds demanded a heavy cost. And sometimes there wasn't a choice of doing something good at all. Times when people could only choose the lesser evil. World War II was a horrible time when people had to make horrible decisions that would haunt them for the rest of their lives. Welcome back to Nutty History, and today we are looking back at the creepiest decisions people had to make during the Second World War. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Now I am become death. A few days after the U.S. had dropped a, well, you know what on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a middle-aged physicist demanded a meeting with President Truman to express his revulsion about what had happened. He told President Truman that his guilt is not letting him sleep anymore and that blood was on his hands. The physicist was Oppenheimer, now known as the father of the atomic bomb. Did you guys go see Oppenheimer yet? Julius Robert Oppenheimer, or Oppie as his peers usually addressed him, was born in 1904 to German-Jewish immigrants who had found wealth in America by trading imported textiles. He studied theoretical physics at the University of Göttingen in Germany after graduating from Harvard University, summa cum laude, and then from Cambridge University. In 1939, several prominent scientists were concerned that Nazi Germany was looking for a super weapon and maybe working on developing atomic bombs. However, things got really real for the United States when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, forcing the country to join the war. The government had to set up a clandestine project to join the race for the super weapon, and Oppenheimer was selected to lead the project in 1941. Oppenheimer became a doctor at the age of 23 and was already rubbing shoulders with the greatest scientific figures of his age, given his academic work was proven an extraordinary advancement to quantum theory and the black hole. When he was approached to lead the Manhattan Project, he had already been teaching for 13 years. Even though France's fall in 1940 had convinced Oppenheimer that the need of the hour was to stop Nazi Germany at any cost, he had his apprehensions about inventing the deadliest man-made object. Even the authorities had doubts about him. Oppenheimer had married in 1940, and his wife's political alliance and opinions had put him under the paranoid crosshair of counterintelligence. The Trinity test was conducted on July 16, 1945 at Alamo Gordo, New Mexico. Three years after the project began, with a team of a few scientists and hundreds of staff, Oppenheimer and his team of physicists employed a team of 130,000 support staff members to make the impossible happen. A small sun exploded on Earth, and a gamble of about 2.2 billion U.S. tax dollars paid off. Now, the U.S. had the power to end the war sooner than it would have lasted in the Pacific. Japan had an army of nearly one million dedicated soldiers and, most importantly, hundreds of pilots. These pilots were ready to sacrifice their life by crashing into American warships, carriers, and base camps to cause mass destruction. All of that was saved at the cost of two Japanese cities and approximately 250,000 lives. Oppenheimer knew the cost when he decided to help invent the atomic bomb, but he could not get rid of the guilt. He knew the world would not be the same. Two people laughed. Few people cried, most people were silent. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. His criticism of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings cost him his career, but he continued protesting against the nuclear armament race for the rest of his life. Two White Roses Hans Scholl and Sophia Scholl were two German teenagers who lived during the Second World War, and given their early record, Hitler could not have been more prouder of them. They had features of a pure Aryan race. They were smart, intelligent, sharp kids, who were not only indoctrinated in Nazi ideology, but also were prominent leaders of the Hitler Youth Program. Yet their choices led them, and their friends, to the guillotine, by the same regime that was once fond of them. But why? Well, it probably has to do with Hans' orientation. As a young boy was crossing the threshold of adulthood, he realized that he was different. His friendship with Rolf Futterneck became a rumor in the camp and the Gestapo came knocking at his door. Hans was punished and persecuted for who he was and he was also indicted, tried, and convicted for being involved in anti-Nazi activities. However, Hans was also an exemplary cadet of the Hitler Youth Program. 
so the judge gave him only a month in prison. On December 18, 1937, Hans vowed to his parents in a letter that he will become something greater for the sake of mankind. But the pivotal point in Hans' life came in the summer of 1942, when he was forced out of medical school and sent to serve as a medic on the Eastern Front. He and his friends, Alexander Schmorell and Willy Graf, had to witness the plight of prisoners, along with people incarcerated from other minorities in the Warsaw Ghetto. Many hungry children were sprawling in the streets asking for bread. There were people being killed every day. The sights broke him and his friends. They went back to Munich with a purpose. Along with his intellectual sister Sophie, Hans and his friends decided to do something. The public needed to see what they saw, so they formed a clandestine organization under the mentorship of their philosophy professor, Kurt Huber. It was an act of treason, but they had no better choice. Disillusioned by violence, Hans and Sophie decided that their secret society would protest the Nazi regime non-violently. They chose the name White Rose for their secret society based on the title of a book by Rhett Marut that was banned by the Nazis. Marut's work was quite popular as fuel on the Nazi book-burning nights. From Munich to Frankfurt to Vienna to Berlin, White Rose circulated at least 7,000 leaflets in 16 major cities in Europe, inspiring people to stand up against fascism. Eventually, some of the leaflets landed in the hands of the Gestapo. The literature was nothing like the Gestapo had seen before. It wasn't rigid ideological tracts, but erudite manifestos, written with passion and an appeal to all classes of German society. On February 18, 1943, while Germany was tasting the bitter taste of defeat in the USSR, Hans and Sophie entered the atrium of the University of Munich. They had 1,700 copies of their new anti-Hitler leaflet. After passing out 1,600 of them among students, they pushed the remaining 100 from the highest gallery to float down to the floor. Now unknown to them, the janitor of the university saw them and he was an undercover Gestapo agent. Only four days later, the siblings and their friend Christoph Probst were found guilty of treason in a mock trial and sent to the guillotine immediately. Their final moments before their execution were recorded to have been courageous despite making such a choice. Sophie famously stated that it is, quote, such a fine sunny day and I have to go. Hans was 24 and Probst 23. Sophie was 21. The Japanese Diplomat in the summer of 1940, Lithuania was on the verge of being merged into the Soviet Union. As USSR was more friendly towards Axis powers back then, 15,000 Jewish people who fled from Poland to escape Nazis were anxious about their future and wanted to escape somewhere else. Chiyuini Sujihawa was the first vice consul of Japan in Lithuania, and he was facing a hard decision. As Jewish refugees flocked to his consulate, Sugihara got an ultimatum. Lithuania was under Soviet rule and all foreign diplomats were asked to leave by August. Sugihara was already packing bags when he was asked to hear the Jewish refugees plea. With diplomats leaving, refugees had no option to leave Lithuania. So Japan was their only hope. Amidst the chaos, it was difficult to obtain clear instructions from Tokyo and Sugihara used it to his advantage. He gave 10-day transit visas to nearly 2,140 people without caring if they had real passports or not or if their documents were complete or not even though Tokyo reached out to him eventually and asked him not to issue visas without sufficient travel money and papers. Now, during the 1940s, if the head of a household was granted a visa, all family members listed in his passport were also granted entry. This means that the visas issued by Sugihara saved many thousands of Jewish lives. Sugihara could have been arrested for treason if Germany would have gotten wind of what he was doing and had pressured Japan to persecute him. But fortunately, Sugihara managed to keep his operation secret from the Nazis, and he even served in Romania, a German ally for the rest of the war. What a guy. Frenkiel's List Estera Frenkiel was a Polish teenager who was taken to a concentration ghetto in Łódź, along with 160,000 Jewish people in the spring of 1940. As Germans preferred not to enter ghettos, these communities were often self-administered, meaning that people appointed to run the ghetto had some privileges over other Jewish prisoners. Estera was a fortunate kid working as a junior secretary in the office of the Jewish Council's chief, Chaim Unkowski. In 1942, the Nazi ghetto manager offered Estera a choice. He was there to order the deportation of Jewish people unable to work. That meant the children, the elderly, and the sick were to be sent home. Now, in simple words, they were being sent to die in concentration camps. So he offered Estera a privilege to save 10 children from a certain death. Now, though it seems like an opportunity, it was a huge moral dilemma. She could save any 10 children among the nearly 50,000 children in the ghetto. 
but it also meant she was sending thousands of them to die. It was a terrible conundrum to make that list, but she made the easy choice. She chose her relatives and her neighbor, the people she knew. In her words, quote, it was easier this way. Sending someone you know personally to death was a horrible choice and I didn't want to do so. That said, she still experienced a guilty conscience, but she always believed she made the right choice given people must always look after those who are the nearest. To make an example. In May 1945, the horrible war was coming to an end in Europe with Berlin invaded and captured by the USSR. German soldiers knew they had only one choice, throw down their weapons and be at the mercy of the Soviet army. As the captives began to gather, the Soviets began interrogations. The Red Army expected Germans to talk without wasting time as they wanted the information for themselves before the British and American armies got there. Desperate times demanded desperate measures and as this was Stalin's Red Army, there was virtually no limit they would not cross to get what they wanted. Smirsch, the counterintelligence unit of Soviet Russia, reached out to a 22-year-old nurse, Zineda Pukina. She was tending to Soviet soldiers. The poor woman had lost almost her entire family in the war after German troops invaded the USSR. The counterintelligence offered Pukina a new assignment. Now they knew how angry Pukina was and they provided her an opportunity to use that anger. She was about to become the overseer of an interrogating unit. Their task would be to extract information from POWs about Nazi units, their specific missions, battle plans, and the names of their commanders. She was also given absolute liberty over how to treat these prisoners of war if they didn't want to cooperate or didn't want to talk. Uh-oh. To prove that she could handle such an assignment, she was asked to sort out a German major. She simply didn't have to take his life, but she needed to make a spectacle out of him to scare the other German POWs. So she walked out and pulled the trigger on the major at point-blank range without hesitation. Following months, Zeneda Pukina conducted routine beatings as well as punished German soldiers to gain information. After getting what she needed from them, she would end their lives and throw their bodies into pre-dug graves and go inside for a quick drink. Even decades after what she had to do, she had no remorse over her actions. She said the Germans would have done the same thing to her if the tables were turned. The Fate of the Croats the Second World War was a war of uneasy alliances. I mean, no matter which side would have won, friends would have become enemies the moment their common enemies were defeated. When Berlin fell to the USSR in May of 1945, tensions were at an all-time high between the Western Alliance and the Communist countries. An intelligence officer, Nigel Nicholson, was with the First Guards Brigade in southern Austria where thousands of Yugoslavian soldiers had taken refuge with their families from the Communist Marshal Tito and his partisans. Winston Churchill gave orders to send these refugees to Italy, but the senior officers of the British Army in Austria didn't want this matter to ignite a new flame of international violence, so they decided to hand these refugees to Tito. Nicholson was between a rock and a hard place because of these conflicting orders. He made the terrible decision of lying in his situation report that Yugoslavia welcomed the refugees with open arms, when in fact the truth was then Nicholson and other British officers lied to refugees about their destination and then walked away after handing them to Tito, knowing very well that none of them would survive. History recalls this barbaric event as the Bleiberg tragedy, where 2,000 Croatian men and women lost their lives for, according to Nigel Nicholson, quote, greater good. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you enjoyed the video, leave us a like and share it, and we'll see you next time.